we're all managing to keep warm and dry on this beautiful summer day. I would like to start my talk with a question. What is the most critical element for our development? I think most of us would say it's carbon dioxide. We urgently need to curb our carbon emissions if we want to stave off climate change. From the opposite perspective, there are still people that would say we need to continue to extract and exploit fossil fuels. Renewable energy and clean tech experts would argue that our development relies on the energy transition and on the availability of rare materials such as silicon and lithium or on our hydrogen production capacity. Futurists will argue that um, graphene is the super material that will enable disruptive technologies of the future or that large-scale production of algae is going to provide us with a sustainable alternative for our fuels, nutrients, and plastics of the future. But the substance I'm going to talk about today is both priceless and, as the speakers before me pointed out, is grossly undervalued. Of course, I know you know what I'm going to talk about. It's obviously water. So what's the deal with water? Water is everywhere, right? We all learn from primary school that water goes through a cycle. And unlike most of the other elements that I've presented before, water is renewable. Let's say it starts with rain. Rain accumulates to form our rivers and lakes. It's where our drinking water comes from. Some is stored underground, some evaporates and feeds back into the clouds. And in solid form, it forms the glaciers, which in turn melt to feed our rivers and lakes. And so the cycle turns. It's a beautiful thing, if you ask me. What you see here is not a desert. This is the bottom of what used to be the Aral Sea. Huge irrigation projects have diverted almost all the water from the two rivers that used to feed it to irrigate one crop, cotton. Cotton that's used to produce clothing that we might be wearing here today. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a time lapse of the last 30 years that shows the water slowly disappearing. And for those of you geographically challenged, the Aral Sea is located in Central Asia between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Also, it's not really a sea. It's the fourth largest lake in the world. It's about twice the size of Belgium. Not only do we use too much, we also pollute a bit too much. What you see here is an, is an example from Ghana, but I could have easily spent the rest of the afternoon taking you through a slide of polluted rivers across the world. So what are these two examples trying to tell us? We have effectively broken the water cycle. We consume and we pollute at rates too high for nature to do its thing, to replenish and to restore itself. But what does that have to do with us here in Belgium where we can't even enjoy a summer day at a festival because of the rain? We have abundant water, clean water. Well, allow me a moment of nerdiness in which I will torture you with a few boldly colored scientific maps. This map shows the virtual water imports to Europe. What is virtual water, I hear you ask. Very good question. It's not the physical water that's contained in a product. It's the water that was produced in a certain location to produce a good. What we see here is that Europe is a virtual water importer of the highest range, between 100 and 300 billion cubic meters of water per year. That's the kind of number my mind just gives up on trying to understand. Where does that water come from? Well, it can come in the form of coffee or soy from Brazil. It can come in the form of maize from the US or rice and cotton from India or China. The second map shows water scarcity around the globe. The darker the red, the higher the number of months people have to live with water scarcity. We have found that two thirds of the world population live in conditions of water scarcity at least a month a year. 
with half a billion people living in conditions of water scarcity the whole year through. And those estimations are only rising. If we compare the two maps, we see that a relatively water abundant region like Europe is importing products produced with scarce water resources from regions like India. When we import goods, we need to be aware of the impact producing those goods has in those countries. This is not to say that we should stop producing goods or stop importing things from other countries. It's to make us aware of the impact our consumption might have in the countries of production and in making us responsible for taking action to remediate that impact. And this is not just you know, scientific data that nobody knows about. The media has been sounding alarm bells for quite a while now. Awareness about water scarcity, pollution, and the effects it has on conflict are well known. But why am I here today on the stage to talk to you about water? Who am I? What you see here is yours truly taking water samples from a mountain stream in my grandparents' village in Transylvania. Yes, it exists, in Romania. I was doing my bachelor thesis. Um, and as you can see, my university was a bit challenged in terms of equipment. I had to use a metal can that I tied with wire to a wooden stick. In search for better to tools of the trade, I left my country and I went on to study nature conservation. Where else but in the wild wilderness of the Netherlands? Here you can see me. Um, with slightly more advanced equipment, this beautiful astronaut suit, and a very rusty shovel. And no, I didn't lose a lot of weight. They didn't have suits in my size. There are many ways in which you can have impact on water. And I've considered most, if not all of them. You can choose a career in politics. You can choose to be an activist. Or you can choose to be a technology developer, an impact entrepreneur. But early in my career, I became familiar with the work of Professor Ian Hoekstra. He was the developer of the water footprint concept and a close advisor to our company until his untimely passing away. I'm very honored that I can be here on the stage today and present his work in front of you. In our field of work, we've recently seen a trend with large companies such as Google, Facebook, Procter & Gamble, Meta, all setting goals and targets for becoming either water neutral or water positive. But currently, there is no framework, no definition that says, what does that mean? How do you achieve that? And how do you check that those claims are valid? It's not only the companies, but also governments are increasingly taking action on water. Paris has pledged to clean the most romantic river in the world, in preparation for next year's Olympic Games and to then give it back to its citizens to swim in it. And just as we can tell the health of a person by analyzing its blood, we can also tell the health of a city by analyzing the cleanliness of its rivers. So this is where we come in. As Water Footprint Implementation, we've developed a framework that helps both companies and governments set targets and carry out activities that help restore, replenish, and protect the water resources on which they depend. Here you have a conceptual illustration of our methodology. We've worked it down to four simple steps, but you have to take my word for it. It's much more complicated than this. But it starts with measuring your water consumption, knowing where in the world your impact lies. If you are a business, you need to know if your supply chain is having a negative impact on water scarcity or pollution somewhere else in the world. Once you've done that, you can take action to reduce your water footprint, reduce the amount of water that you consume. When you've become as efficient as possible, there will still be an amount of water that's left to produce the goods we need. For that amount of water, you can compensate your negative impacts by investing in projects that replenish restore or protect the same water resources on which you as a company or as a government depend. 
The final step, and equally important, is to communicate about your efforts. It's not every time that investing in a project, in a water project, is going to work out well. So you need to be able to transparently communicate about your efforts and about your results. What does that mean in practice? Here you have one of our three pilot projects as example. This relates to groundwater management. We can capture rainwater and store it in the ground to be used during drought periods for irrigation of farmlands. Another potential example is wastewater treatment. In this case, the little blue installation there treats wastewater from a community in Palestine and provides an alternative water source in a community where there was none before. And it helps to green the community. Here you have a glimpse of what the future can bring us. This is an art meet science project. It's called the Sun Glacier. It captures water from air and can provide drinking water even in the most arid regions in the world. So these are just examples of existing or future technologies that can help both companies and governments to compensate for their water use by either restoring, replenishing, or protecting water resources. Why do we do all this? To avoid paying a price we can't afford. In the run-up to the United Nations Water Conference in New York, which took place in March this year, we've partnered with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and with creative design agencies to communicate to a broad audience the impacts of water scarcity and pollution. This is a market for a future in water crisis. We have also haven't been working on this all alone. We have partners and inspirational partners. What you see here is the 11th Hour Racing Team. They have been our main inspirational partner that has been pushing us and helping us develop the water footprint compensation concept. Just as they have been believing in their own dream, and they, I think just about a month ago, they've won the ocean race, the world's toughest and longest uh, competition, so do we want to win our own race to replenish, restore, and protect our freshwater resources before it's too late. And so can you. If you want to join our coalition of the willing and help restore the planet's freshwater resources, this is where you can find us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ioana. Uh, I'm also going to ask you a question after this very interesting uh, presentation. I think it's important for people to connect with what we do. So I would ask you what could people, if they want to, to reduce their water footprint, footprint today? What could they do today in their yeah, average uh, going on? There's a lot of tips that we normally give consumers, people like you here today. You, know, you can use, eat less meat. In general, just buy less stuff, right? Everything we use and consume takes water to produce. Just consume less. But I don't really believe in putting pressure on the consumer on individual choices. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. I don't believe that people should have a PhD in ecology or in sustainability when they go to a supermarket to read all the labels and to know, OK, this one has less CO2, this one has less water. I believe we can make a greater impact if we go to, our, to the companies that we work with, to the institutions that we work with, and we ask them, do you know what impact you have on water? And if you do, what action are you going to take to remediate that? Thank you very much. <clears throat>